Good evening. Open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Peter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings that you've given us today. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for this word that you have given us from your servant, the Apostle Peter. We pray, Father, that you help us to discern your will for us in this world and in your kingdom. And help us, Father, to live it out faithfully. Thank you for the gifts that you've given us in Jesus, for his teachings, for the mercy that we receive through his blood, the hope that we have in his resurrection. And Father, we, uh, we eagerly await his return. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we might have thought that last week's message on the priesthood of Christ would be the end of our series on priesthood. But I want to cap off this study uh, through the scriptures and what they have to say about priesthood by considering something that I think often goes neglected, at least in my experience. It's not something that I've at least heard talked about uh, all that often. Uh, again, we generally conclude this matter of priesthood by considering Christ, and it, it makes sense, right? We've reached the pinnacle, as it were. He is the ultimate priest. He is the great high priest who lives forever and is always interceding for us at the right hand of God. He has made an offering once for all time of his blood, right? So there's, that seems to be like end of discussion, right? But there is another priesthood that we have yet to speak of together in this series related to Christ's own priesthood. In fact, it has its basis on Christ's priesthood. We sometimes call it the priesthood of all believers. And we've read about it in our text tonight. You look at the way that Peter refers to us. And he, he makes this connection between us and Christ explicit, by the way. Right? He says that we ourselves are like living stones being built up as a spiritual house right? where Christ is the cornerstone. Right? He's the chief stone and we're built up off of him. But look at what that spiritual house is, according to Peter. Right? We're being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he doesn't just say it once, he says it again in verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. And I don't know if we're accustomed to think of ourselves in that way, but think about the way that you think about yourself. We're going to have a little meta discussion, as it were. How do you think about yourself? Well, I think of myself as Christian. Right? Well, what's that mean? There's, that, that gets described a lot of different ways in the New Testament. Do you think of yourself as a priest in any sense, any form or fashion of that word? Peter invites us to, and he's not the only one. 
John likewise refers to us this way in Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, just as we were singing about earlier, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So not only does John call us priests, he tells us who made us priests. It's Jesus that did it. And I want us also to consider an image that we receive in Revelation chapter 5. In fact, I want to go to Revelation 5. This is worth getting in its entirety. Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals, and I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to, to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Right, there, you notice they are confessing the same thing that John had just confessed at the beginning of the letter. But let's finish this hymn. All right, you have, by your blood, you have ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the mighty voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And so we not only see uh, the four living creatures and the 24 elders in this new song of theirs, confessing the same thing that John said at the beginning of the letter, that Christ, by his blood, has ransomed us as a people for God, made us into a kingdom and priests to God. And by the way, this is consistent with what Peter was saying, too. Right, that, God is trans that Jesus has transformed us into a kingdom of priests. Uh, and not only do they confess that, but in this chapter, sometimes when we start talking about the... the any kind of priesthood outside of Christ's priesthood, we get kind of weary because, all right, wait a minute. Christ is the great high priest. Why do we even need to talk about any other kind of priesthood? And in this context, 
Revelation 5 shows us that to speak of the church, to speak of the saints as a kingdom and priests to God, does absolutely nothing to steal glory from Christ. Because this entire chapter is about how only Christ, only the Lamb, is worthy to open this scroll. And he's worthy to open it because he has conquered through his blood. And everybody, the myriads of angels, and every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they're all confessing the glory of the Lamb. And so to confess that Christ, through his blood, has made us a kingdom and priests to God does nothing to take any glory away from Christ. And so we find multiple places in the New Testament that describe us in these terms, that we are a priesthood in some way. Now, I would be remiss, by the way, if I didn't mention this, but you notice how all of these references to our priesthood speak to the church universally. Nowhere in the New Testament do we find any narrower set of people in the church acting as priests over the church as its own position in the hierarchy over the church. We find apostles, we find overseers called by various names in the New Testament, like elders, presbyters, uh, even the English word bishop is an appropriate, it, 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 it is an appropriate translation of the word, even if it has become abused in English to mean something other than what it is. There are lots of terms for overseer. Um, but we find them, we find deacons, we find preachers and teachers, but nowhere in the New Testament do we find priests as an office in or over the church. Instead, what we find is a priesthood that is given to all believers, which is where we come up with this phrase, the priesthood of all believers. Now, that probably suggests some questions to us. Mainly, what does it mean for us to be priests to God? whenever we have a high priest such as Christ? Like, what's left for us to do if we are priests to God underneath the great high priest Jesus Christ? Because we usually think of priesthood primarily in terms of the forgiveness of sins, right? But we confess that Christ's priesthood alone is sufficient for all time, for the forgiveness of all sins. So again, what, what's left for us to do? Right, we obviously have no role in the forgiveness of sins, at least not in the sense in which we've been talking about in the priesthood, that is, standing between another person and God and making offerings to God on behalf of this other person for the forgiveness of their sins. Obviously, we do not have any such role as that. So if our priesthood doesn't include that, again, what does it even mean for us to be priests? So what I want to spend our time establishing this evening, I want us to go back to our text in 1 Peter, and I want us to broaden the net a bit and get some context around what Peter writes there in 1 Peter 2, because he has a broader message for us, uh, and what he says about us being a holy priesthood or a royal priesthood uh, in chapter 2 is part of a broader message. So go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 13. We're going to read a bit there. <clears throat> and we'll get the sense in which Peter is talking about us as priests. Therefore, Peter says, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds... Conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, 
like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. All right, and let's get a little context on the other end of our reading from 1 Peter 2. Uh, we ended our reading in verse 10. Let's go to verse 11. So 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, uh, there are things in both of those passages that, that, or that both of those passages have in common. We have mentioned every week in this series, what is the greatest weakness of every system of priesthood that we read about in the scriptures except for Christ's? What's the biggest weakness of every single priesthood, whether it's individual priesthood like Cain and Abel, or the patriarchs, or the priesthood of Aaron? The biggest problem, well, one of the biggest problems is they die. But I'd say even bigger than that, bigger than the physical problem, is the moral problem. The biggest problem is the character of the priests themselves. Every priest, and this is something that the Hebrew writer talks about, how every priest, whenever he comes in to make sacrifices for the sins of the people, What's he have to do first before he can atone for the sins of the people? He has to atone for his own sins first. The biggest problem has always been the character of the priests themselves. And it's a big problem for the people, right? Because an imperfect priest cannot adequately represent the people and deal with their sin. We saw how Christ fixes that. But it's also a big problem for the priest himself, and the scriptures show us that in pretty uncomfortable detail, right? Because whenever Nadab and Abihu are imperfect as priests, it's not, you know, some old slap on the wrist. They, they're crispy critters. When Hophni and Phinehas are imperfect as priests, they're slain in battle, killed by Philistines. The scriptures don't show us these things as though we are spectators who get to sit in our cozy seats and act as armchair critics. Right? You know, you can be an armchair general or an armchair coach, you know, watching some, uh, some sports program on TV. You can be an armchair priest, too. Right? We can be armchair judges. We can be armchair kings. We do that a lot as we study the scriptures. We're armchair critics, uh, where we get to look down on people that are written about in the Bible as though we wouldn't act the exact same way that they do. The scriptures don't invite us to act as armchair critics, not even in the priesthood. The scriptures spend all of this time showing us how prone human priests are to corruption and error, you know, unholiness. And then, here close to the end of our Bibles... The scriptures turn around and tell us, all right, now it's your turn. All right, now we're in the hot seat. We are called to be holy, just as the men of old were. That's what Peter says. It is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That didn't disappear. The witness of the Old Testament is an open question for us. Will we strive for the holiness of priesthood in Christ, or will we fall short? In other words, the forgiveness that we receive from Christ as our high priest does not excuse us from the call to live holy and righteous lives. Instead, we are called to greater holiness than most Israelites were called to. We're 
called to greater holiness even than most Levites were called to. All right? Not everyone in Israel was called to the same high level of priestly holiness. Now, that's kind of what the Nazarite vow is about when you think about it. It's an optional uh, practice that Israel can engage in where for a limited time they become as holy as priests. But everyone in the church is called to an equally high level of holiness. It's not, you know, people in the pews are one level of holiness and then a step up, a step up from that is deacons and then the people have to be even more holy than that or the elders and the preacher. It doesn't work that way in the church. We are all called to an equal level of holiness and it is extremely high. Remember, Christ's teachings in the Gospels are harder, not easier, than the law. And we could summarize it just with one statement that Christ makes in his sermons. You must therefore be, what, kind of decent, kind of sort of okay. You must be perfect as your Father is perfect. And so by referring to us as a priesthood, the New Testament reminds us of the great level of holiness to which we are called. But the priesthood of believers is not just about our character, though. It's not just us, you know, turned in on ourselves reflexively, making sure, okay, i got to make sure that I am holy. There are places in the New Testament that describe our works for others in priestly terms as well. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 We're going to read the first eight verses. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God... And there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Now Paul uses a, a term here that is normally only used of Christ and of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. Intercession. Now, we know, of course, that we are not talking about intercession in exactly the same way as what Christ makes for us. And yet, Paul uses the same word here. Right? Obviously, whatever we are doing does not compare to what Christ does for us or to what the Spirit does for us. And yet Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. We are still commanded to intercede. And Paul follows this up by saying, this is good. It's pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? And Paul is naming this in the context of prayer. To intercede for others, biblically, is to ask God not to give other people what punishment they deserve. We find Moses interceding on behalf of Israel when God is determined to destroy them. He does this at least a couple of times. Right? Particularly after the incident with the golden calf. God tells Moses, All right, you just hold on right there while I nuke these people, and I'm going to start over with you. And what does Moses say to God? Please don't do that. <laughs> For your own name's sake, have mercy on this people, Moses says. He intercedes for them. 
We find the prophet Jeremiah interceding for Judah until God has to tell Jeremiah to stop. Right? God tells Jeremiah at one point in his ministry, don't intercede for these people anymore because I'm about to judge them. And I'm not going to be stopped. And of course, most recently in our studies, we have seen Stephen, the martyr, interceding on behalf of those who were stoning him to death. Remember what the, the word says. Falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And I suppose the question we got to ask for ourselves is, is Stephen entitled to make that kind of request to God? Well, yeah. This is exactly what Paul is talking about when he says, I urge that intercessions be made for all people. This is precisely the kind of thing he's talking about. Stephen is within his rights to ask God, don't hold this sin against them. And we noted this when we studied that text last week, that Stephen is imitating our Lord, who likewise prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Right? All of the people that they prayed for, whether we're talking about Moses or Jeremiah or Stephen or Jesus, every single one of the people that they prayed for, that they interceded for, deserved whatever they had coming to them. Right? Well, sometimes we sing that as a hymn, right? that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels. That's absolutely what the chief priests and the elders would have deserved. It's what Rome would have deserved. For God's angels to come in judgment and to just winnow all of them out. And yet that is not what we find Jesus doing. The men of faith and our Lord himself asked for mercy on the behalf of these men who deserved punishment and judgment. And so here's a good practical question for you. Besides asking yourself, all right, am I in the habit of thinking of myself in terms of priesthood? Do I, do I think of myself as a priest, the way that Peter's talking about, part of a royal and holy priesthood? Besides asking yourself, do I think of myself that way? Are you in the habit of asking God's mercy on other people? Right, we pray all kinds of things. But are we regular in praying God to have mercy on people who do not deserve it? The world is quite satisfied to watch people get their comeuppance. Right? And the world gets that quality from their father, the devil. It's an easy kind of satisfaction to fall into. And i got to confess, I'm prone to it. So I, I don't feel bad preaching hard on it. Uh, it is something that I personally have to be on guard about because there's nothing quite as satisfying to me as watching somebody get it good and hard when they deserve it. And in fact, we sometimes talk about poetic justice as though punishment were music to our ears. And we even have a name for the feeling of enjoyment that we might get from watching another person's misfortune. We call it schadenfreude. But all of that comes closer to resembling the world and resembling the adversary than it does to resembling Jesus Christ and the holy men of faith whose model we have uh, recorded down through the ages. We are called to intercede for people to ask God's mercy on people who do not deserve it, because here's the secret about mercy. No one deserves it, by definition. Asking for God's mercy, by the way, does not put us in opposition to God's justice, because God himself is the one who wills his justice, and God himself is the one who calls us to make intercession, as Paul said, this is from God. It is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God 
who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, there's a lot more that I could say about what it means for us to be a royal priesthood. In Romans 15, for example, Paul uh, refers to his own ministry to the Gentiles as a form of priesthood. And in 2 Corinthians 5.16, Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Right, and Paul doesn't use the word priest or priesthood in that text. But that's what he's describing here. That's the, the work of priests that we have been talking about all of this time. He speaks of our ministry of reconciliation, where we act as ambassadors for Christ. That is, we represent God before man and call man back to a proper relationship with God. All of which, again, ought to sound very familiar to people who are familiar with the priesthood of old. Right, there's a lot more that we could say about this. In fact, we've not even touched what Peter said about the sacrifices that we offer. Yeah, we could suggest some things about that, like what Paul says in Romans 12, what our sacrifice is. But time fails us. I want to conclude by admonishing us that the faith is not just some lifestyle that we pick up that makes us personally, individually right with God, right? where each of us is a little island. It's far greater than that. It is a calling into the royal priesthood that Peter spoke of in tonight's reading, that John likewise wrote about, that Paul writes about. It is a calling to be holy. It's a calling to seek God's mercy on behalf of others. It's a calling to urge others to reconcile with God. It is a call that we ought to take seriously. And so I urge you, in your walk of faith, remember yourself, what kind of person you are called to be in the kingdom of God. And so we want to end by urging everyone to be reconciled with God. Those who have not obeyed him to begin with, we urge you, to believe the good news, turn away from sin, confess Jesus as Lord, and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And those who have obeyed but gone astray, we urge you, be reconciled to him. Whatever stands between you and God, make sure that it is removed. And if there is any way that we can help, let us know by coming forward as together we stand and sing.